Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Hi, and welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. In this episode, we are joined by neonatal pediatric hospitalist and academic pediatrician, Dr. Amy Rule. Listen in as she discusses her concerns about if and how her disability would impact her chances of going to medical school, the power of messaging from pre-med advisors, her experiences interviewing for medical school and residency, and the lessons learned along the way. Throughout their conversation, Dr. Meeks and Dr. Rule touch on how Dr. Rule's disability impacts her work as a pediatrician. We begin with an introduction from Dr. Rule. My name is Amy Rule, and I am a neonatal and pediatric hospitalist and academic pediatrician. I'm an assistant professor at Emory School of Medicine. And I also am the director of a center for perinatal equity research and director of the global health pathway for the pediatric residency. I identify as a woman with a disability. I grew up with a rare skeletal dysplasia. So I have intermittently used mobility devices throughout my life and throughout my medical training and my career as an academic pediatrician. And I also have congenital hearing loss. I use an amplified stethoscope when I'm doing my cardiac and pulmonary exams. And I'm like a bit of a misfit toy of the misfit toys. So I have a really rare condition, like less than one in a million. And then on top of that, most people with my condition are little people or short statue or have dwarfism. I turned out to not that be that way. So I'm like a naturally occurring giant, which means that I'm mostly average height. But as a result of being relatively on the tall side, I actually had more orthopedic interventions earlier, not to make me taller, but to try to preserve my joints. So I spent a lot of time as a pediatric orthopedic patient, especially between the ages of about eight and 16. So I was like old enough to understand a little bit more of what was going on. I was really privileged. My dad was in the military, and so we were able to travel for care to a center that was like a high-volume center, and it was covered by our insurance. I had a ton of privileges. And because I traveled to a center that had a lot of other families with skeletal dysplasia, I met people that were like me, meaning that they had a very similar disability to me. They had a lot of shared experiences. We might even have the same surgeon, the same doctors. And I met them at the Ronald McDonald House and in the waiting room. But I also became very aware very quickly that I would not have met a lot of these people if I didn't have this experience of disability or this rare condition. They often came from completely different parts of the country or even the world. And so I got really interested in some of those differences, even though I didn't necessarily have the words to say that inherently some things in life had gone really well for me, like having insurance because my dad was a federal employee. I'm a child of the ADA. I, I got to go to public school after going to segregated Head Start because I literally was in first grade the year that the ADA was passed. Um, and so, you know, I, I had some inherent civil rights and opportunities. And so I, I was really interested not only in other people's sort of medical situations, and I was a very nosy kid, I guess, in these situations. Like, I was interested in what was happening with the kids around me, including the kids who didn't have skeletal dysplasia. So I became very interested in that and then also very interested in what I now know to be social determinants of health and health equity and global health equity. And so I went to college pretty sure that I was going to be pre-med. I was very worried from the very beginning. In fact, I think I had this conversation with the guy who was in charge of the pre-med program at my university 
when I was a freshman was like, I have a disability, I use a wheelchair for long distance walking, what are the odds of me getting into med school? And he looked me right in the eye and he's like, I think you're going to be fine. He's like, the right med school will see it as an asset. And even then I was like, mm, I don't know about that, but okay, I, I, will, I will tag on to your optimism and I will work really, 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 really hard. And you know, this is like in the early 2000s. And so there was not very much data. I remember trying to look it up and I didn't really know very much, except that there were not many doctors that looked like me, other than one guy that I had seen on the Discovery Health Channel. And then when I had, initially, they were like in sort of non-people fields, like radiology mm -hmm. or pathology. And I was like a super extrovert. I wanted to know more about those kids in the waiting room as sort of like idealistic and cute as that is. I really wanted to do peds. And so I was, I was very worried that like that would not necessarily be as open to me. So I worked really hard in undergrad. And I also did lots of other things that would be very influential in my career. So anyway, I applied to medical school. I look back and I think about some of the things that were asked of me in a medical school <laughs> interview. I'm like, I just can't believe it. I do med school and residency interviews now. And I shudder as I get ready to repeat some of these stories. It was like right around the time that like the Dr. House show was coming on. And several people like referred to Dr. House, who uses a cane in the TV show, at least with me. It's like, oh, you'll be like Dr. House. You'll be a disabled doctor like Dr. House. And I remember thinking, I'm just going to keep smiling and thank Hollywood that like maybe I got this interview because they like this TV show. I got a question. Have you ever been addicted to opiates for your chronic pain? This is like legitimate, like an accredited medical school in the region where I was living ask me that in real life. I don't actually remember what I said. I mean, the answer is no. Still, the fact that they would ask me a question like that is so vastly inappropriate. I had several places ask me indirectly, why should we take you over like an entire bucket full of non-disabled applicants? A well-trained physician eye will note that my features, my facial features, are, you know, somewhat characteristic of someone who has, you know, a connective tissue or skeletal difference. I had to disclose. But one thing I'll say about that is that I tried to use that to my advantage. I knew I was going to get questions. And so I, I came up with answers that I was okay with. And I, I ran them across people. I talked to some of the professors and different people at my college and tried to like get some impressions on like what was the best way to handle some of those things. And I went in trying to be able to come up with a narrative where like my disability is an asset. It's a it's a diversity asset. It's an asset because your patients look like me. 20% of them do, maybe more. And having a pediatrician that looks like the children that we, you know, I care for, potentially that matters. That's important. And I didn't even have words like representation at that point. That's the case that I like prepared myself to make. Did you fear at the time that you were applying that your disability would keep you from being admitted? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I had that fear as a freshman. I mean, I, I really did go to the pre-medical advisor like the first semester of college and be like, I'm disabled. I want to go to medical school. I know it's going to be hard what do I do? And he was like, calm down. Like, he's like, you're only a freshman. And, but he also, he really believed, and I don't know where he got this from, because I'm pretty sure, at least with a visible disability, I was one of the first people to come through that program. But he really did believe that, like, I would, I would be able to spin it as, as a positive. But I think that's a shout out to, like, the impact that, like, someone planning that idea into a young student's head can make. Because I, I did. I, I really use some of that to like base my own narrative to prepare myself for those interviews. So yeah, 100%. And I really, I was like a lot of young folks with disabilities. And I think this is, there's some interesting sociologies, particularly around young people with physical disabilities that like, if I'm really amazing academically, people will, people will accept me. And I definitely had some of that and felt like I had to do better than my peers to have a shot of getting into medical school. 
I interviewed regionally. Again, like I think I had some self-awareness. I was very single at the time and like I wanted to make sure that I had some support. So I didn't interview quite as widely as I think some people might have. Um, But I think I applied to 15 or 20 schools. And then I think I got interviewed at like maybe seven to 10 of them. But I think I actually only ended up going to five. Like I think I turned down some interviews at the end once I had had some options. One thing I didn't talk about in my initial narrative is, so there was sort of like the psychosocial thing I had to overcome. Like I had to make my case about why taking on the responsibility of a disabled medical student was worth it for a medical school. Like while I was a good investment and while I was worth not taking another non-disabled person in the same slot. But there was the other part, which is like, can I actually get around your medical school? Oh my goodness. It was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so there were two state medical schools, but I was in state court. I will say that I was privileged enough to get um, get into both of them. Honestly, I don't know if I could have navigated either of them in my wheelchair. One was a very historic school and the buildings had clearly not been updated in a really long time. I did an accessibility walkthrough, which I highly recommend I so it was sort of like a second look because I, I had an acceptance in hand at this point. Like I had interviewed in the fall and had gotten accepted in like the very early winter, like December, January. And then I was now there in like February or March trying to decide where I was going to go. And it was cheaper. It was cheaper than staying at the place where I went to undergrad. And, and it was a prestigious school. Like it's one of the better in-state med schools in the U.S. And like I could not get into their anatomy lab in my wheelchair. Now, I am a person that has, you know, intermittent mobility, and I can get up out of my wheelchair and walk. But I was like, if I'm exhausted, what's that going to look like? And then it like, they didn't have, they did kind of have stools, but it wasn't totally clear, like how I would navigate being in the anatomy lab. And then they were already scrambling to figure out how they would let me take exams because people stand and walk in a line. And I was like, yeah, I think that would be really hard for me. And they never said, we don't want you, but like, it was very clear for me that it's hard. The third option, which was a little bit pricier, although they did a good job, they actually helped me get a scholarship specifically for disabled graduate students, which ended up paying about close to a third of my tuition. And so between that and Stanford loans and my sister going in state, I was able to like make up the difference, but that school was much more accessible. And then I also had that social support network. And so it was like a no brainer. So ultimately, like, it wasn't about the programs that the school had. It wasn't about like, you know, oh, maybe this place has a really good children's hospital. And I knew I wanted to do peace. It was really 100%. What school can I like navigate? And so I think there was that too. There was like that psychosocial, like, I have to make the case. But then there's also the physical of like, seriously, have you thought about what it would be like to have a disabled medical student? And then can we like actually pull this off? And I, I've often thought, I don't know about those two state schools. I, I hope that they eventually took someone like me and that like accepting me and then losing me made them think about like, well, we're not ready, but I don't know. To this day, I'm not 100% sure what happened. But I do think that that is an experience that other people with disabilities experience in uh, sort of medical school admissions. Even if you get in, can you actually make it work? medical school is so hard to get into. So even when you're making the most informed decision on the front end, you don't always have those options on the back end and the same for residency. But I want to, I want to pull you back really quickly because you made such a good point and it hasn't been made really in the majority of interviews we've done. So I want to go back to that really quickly. And that's about pre-med advisors. You were so lucky, as you pointed out, because that person planted a seed. And if you are not told early on, science and math, STEM, biomedicine, all of this stuff is possible, you are very likely not going to even get to the door of the pre-med advisor. 
Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There's this running joke in our household. And I actually, whenever I, I have this grand round that I've done on disability for pediatric programs a couple places around the country, and I always tell this story. My son, so we also travel for his care for skeletal dysplasia, and that program has multiple physicians with skeletal dysplasia in it. And, and like, there are some of their MAs and all kinds of different people. One of the PAs, like, have, you know, various disability similar to Oliver and I and when Oliver was about three years old he was like mommy people with bone conditions become tv stars and doctors <laughs> and I laughed because I was like oh my goodness like you know most kids with disabilities don't grow up like that that's their world like but his world is, is that his mom is just like him and he's very proud of that and that, like, she's a doctor, and a lot of her friends are doctors. And then when he goes to the doctor once a year, a lot of the people look like him. And so, I mean, I think to your point, like, as cutesy as that is, he's seen that represented in his life. When we moved uh, to Atlanta a year ago, his music teacher at his school uses a walker. And, like, his whole face, because he uses a walker most of the time, his whole face, like, literally was in, like, this, like, look of, like, pleasant surprise. He's like, well, I have a teacher that looks like me. And I think sometimes people get tired of hearing that representation matters. But, like, legit, I don't know what else to say as a pediatrician and as a parent. Like, representation matters. And then, you know, you can't, at this point, it's going to take us a long time to put a disabled appearing person or just closing person, you know, in, in every medical practice or every children's hospital, like that's unrealistic. But I think what allies and advocates and teachers and pre-med advisors can do is they can either direct people towards people that they know, um, or even people that have like written something or then have done an interview or like the Docs with Disabilities podcast and be like, look, like, I'm not sure exactly how to get you to point A, but there are people who have done this and like, we'll figure it out together. And even now, sometimes when I meet with med students and they want to do a subspecialty that's really different than me, disability or not, sometimes I have to say that. I'm like, you know, I really don't know that much about this, but let me make some, you know, calls or be a sponsor and however I can. And so I think that that, that is something that I would say, the other thing I'll say is reflecting back on my own pre-med advisors, there were really three critical ones. There was that guy that I told you about. And I don't even know like what his frame of reference was for that. Because like I said, I maybe he'd had some influential experience. I never asked him. The other person was the head of a disability services for that um, university. And his son, he told me on the very first day I met him when I was doing my accepted students tour with my mother, and we were trying to figure out how to make my dorm accessible. He was like, my son has a pediatrician who has cerebral palsy. He's like, I'm sure you can do this. We'll figure it out. And again, I don't know how many students he had worked with that had wanted to be pre-med and had a physical disability. But again, because he had seen that, he was like, we're going we're gonna to figure it out. I just want to really highlight what you just said about, you said, you know, he had an experience. It wasn't his experience right? But he had an experience which ties into this entire idea that this contact theory idea where just having had an experience with a disabled person will mm -hmm. change your perspective. So your pre-med advisor, the disability person, they didn't need to be a person with a disability necessarily, exactly. but it's very likely that somewhere in their past, they were exposed to a person with a disability who was doing medicine or capable of doing medicine, which then challenged any stereotype that society would provide for us, right? Or still provides, in my opinion, for us. Okay. Um, and that changed them. The mere fact that doctors with disabilities are coming into medicine is impacting the perceptions of non-disabled people. Oh, yeah. And that is huge because it's an exponential impact. In this next section, Dr. Rule shifts to discussing her experiences in medical school, her rotations, and the process of getting accommodations. Well, 
let me tell you a little bit about things that happened to me when I was in medical school because I think it's actually a testament to what you're saying. Although it was a hard one fight, so I got in. I had choices, which was a huge privilege, and I got into a school that at least was physically accessible and had at least said the initial yes, which is huge, but then I had to make it work. And again, I found some, I think, kindred spirits along the way that either had had an encounter with disability. My, my favorite story is my anatomy professor, he had survived, I believe, Guillain Barre. And so he himself had had a very long recovery and had been acutely paralyzed from the waist down for a period of time. And he actually pulled me aside at like the very first like orientation. Let's sit down and let's figure this out. And I didn't know this conversation was going to happen. But he's like, you're in a wheelchair part time. I get that. I've had that experience. Let's figure out how we're going to make anatomy work. He's like, I want this to work for you. And that ended up being huge. I told you about that other story about my state med school that like I couldn't get in the anatomy lab and I wasn't sure I was going to do anatomy exams. And that professor, his name was Dr. Johnson. He was like, yeah, I think you can take it with the same time limits, but you need to take it outside of a line. So we're just going to have you take it while they're taking the histology exam and we'll just switch you and you'll take them individually. And it was huge because like I was able to take it with the same time constraints, but I was able to sit at each body for the practical exams. And that like just one small accommodation like made my whole first year of medical school work. His coming to me also really empowered me to go to other professors that didn't come to me. I built a really good relationship with the dean of students. He was an MFM or maternal fetal medicine doctor. And so I think he was a natural advocate in that way. And one of the things that I really tried to do, which I will not lie, was a little bit exhausting, but I do think it worked, is that I tried to stay about six months ahead. So for example, when I got to the beginning of my second year, I was already thinking about my third year clerkships. And I made a meeting with the dean of students and I was like, all right, let's talk about this because it's going to be a whole new world. And he was like, yeah, he's like, I've been thinking about it. We just need to just, I'm just going to hand make your schedule, especially for surgery and emergency medicine and internal medicine. He's like, we're just going to have to make sure that we're strategic about where we place you. You'll fulfill the requirements, but you're going to do it in a way that makes the most sense. So for example, for my surgery requirement, which was the thing I was the most worried about, like I lost sleep about that for basically five years of my life from about freshman year of college until it was over and about that actually was my very first rotation um, in uh, my third year of med school. I did pediatric surgery for my general surgery requirement, which was great. The patients were really small. It would make sense. I wanted to be a pediatrician. And then a lot of the rounding is in the NICU. And the NICU tends to be a place where people sit on stools and like there's just a culture. And I had volunteered in the NICU. I'd been a NICU feeder as an undergrad. And so like I knew the NICU. And then my subspecialty surgery requirement was ophthalmology, which I'm going to be honest, I had zero interest in. But he was like, you'll love it. They sit down for surgery. And like I didn't really even know that that was true. <laughs> And one of my, like, most surprising, enjoyable rotations was actually my ophthalmology rotation. They were pretty accommodating. They sit down for surgery. At the very end of the rotation, the, like, head of the clerkship sent me down and he's like, are you interested in ophthalmology? We have so enjoyed having you. And I was like, I have intergenitive joint disease in my hands, and I do not think that I'm going to be an ophthalmologist, but bless you. For like having that vision and for like just seeing me as a medical student that you really enjoyed working with and not like seeing all the reasons why that might not be a good fit. And so I found that one of the most hopeful moments in medical school. They just saw me as a student that was curious and, you know, cared and like, you know, showed up and did all the things that a good third year medical student does. And they didn't see me as a student with a disability. So there were high points. Ironically, surgery ended up being actually a really good rotation. I had more trouble in almost everything else. Maybe not psychiatry and family medicine. I think they were fine. I I got a lot of unsolicited questions, sometimes just like in the hallway. Like I remember I was in an elevator. I think it was towards the end of my third year. Random surgeon. To this day, I don't know his name. I couldn't pick him in a lineup. He's like, wait, are you a med student here? And I was like, yes. And he was like, we took you over an average student? how the heck are you going to finish your surgical clerkship? I was like, oh, I already did that. It was great. 
I really enjoyed it. And then I like got off on my floor, like literally like unsolicited in the elevator. I had someone in pediatrics. We were like in a teaching session and like, I don't remember what we were learning about, but it was like hyperbilirubinemia, jaundice in neonates or something. And then out of nowhere, he turns to me and he's like, Amy, what page in Smith's book are you? And I was like, excuse me? And Smith's book is like this book of genetic syndromes. It's like the Bible of pediatric genetics. And I was like, I like was stunned. I could not believe. And like everyone else is stunned. And then this is the best part. This shows you how important and how much um, allies can be helpful. This guy sitting to my left, I had known him since undergrad. He's a wonderful family medicine primary care doctor. He like um, kind of puts his hand on mine and we're good friends. And he like whispers to me, he's like, I think you're in the free hundreds, but I checked it's not your picture. Don't worry. And he had known that like one of my big fears in life was that I was going to walk into a medical lecture and there's going to be like a naked picture of baby Amy. And so like he did that just to make me laugh and to like take the awful out of that moment. Now that same professor wrote me a glowing letter of recommendation that would get me into the residency of my dream. So it was a very paradoxical kind of experience where I did well. But I faced a lot of interesting experiences that looking back were like not even microaggressions. They were just straight out aggressions. I had a lot of trouble with adult doctors. They just had a harder time getting past the disability. They like saw the disability rather than seeing the medical student. They would constantly like stop round. No lie, it was halfway through an H&P on my very first day of geriatrics. Geriatrics, right? Like everyone's disabled. I'm halfway through an ancient P. The attending looks at me. It's my first day on this rotation. And she's like, wait, are you my medical student? You're in a wheelchair. How do I accommodate you? And that same guy, the wonderful uh, now family practice doctor, who ironically does a lot of geriatrics now, she, he, by this point, we're like two thirds through the year. He's just done. He's done on my behalf. And he's like, yep, she's a medical student. And you just interrupted her ancient P. And she was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And like, we just kept going. Like, I kept presenting. I would try to anticipate and I would meet with clerkship directors beforehand. But it was still like constantly everyone's surprised that there could be a medical student and that she could have a visible disability. There was no choice. I was I was out and that was how it was. I was going to be disclosed because my my mere existence was dis- disclosure. But I, I think about what I experienced in that in terms of just straight out, like we said, macro aggressions. And like, I imagine what it's like for students who have invisible disabilities and how much harder it is, because not only are they probably experiencing a lot of the same macro aggressions, but they're having to also like convince people that they need their accommodation. It was pretty obvious that I was going to use my wheelchair on rounds when I showed up and around in my wheelchair, right? But, you know, if you have other disabilities where it's not as obvious, it can be a lot harder. It is shocking to me what people say, but I think it's also evidence of such a lack of education. And I'm sorry you went through that, but I am particularly grateful that you had what sounds like not even an ally, but an accomplice who utilized humor to diffuse some of this for you. Make no mistake, a lot of people do this. They come up with, you had talked earlier about coming up with some things to say, some answers in advance, if you will, some scripts to diffuse awkward conversations or to be able to communicate your competence when it was questioned, knowing that that was going to happen. But make no mistake that the psychological burden is still there. Even if there's humor, even if someone acts on your behalf, the collective burden over time is still pretty incredible. And you know, you have to process that somehow. And how do you process that? I look back and like, I think to some degree, I numbed some of it out. Like I, uh, like many folks that grow up with a congenital disability, 
I was persistent and determined and I wanted to be a pediatrician and I was like, whatever, I'm just going to like deal with the crap to get to what I really want. And so I think there was some of that. I did, I had several non-disabled allies, accomplices who were like, would laugh with me and also cry with me. And I, I think that that for, you know, non-disabled students and trainees that listen, like you don't know how powerful that is, whether it's a disability or rather it's, you know, being a person of color or being queer or whatever it is, like it, it is so incredibly powerful to have those allies and accomplices. The other thing is, is that I had a single friend who was also a disabled medical student at another medical school about 40 miles away. So I would get in my car because it was a little easier for me to drive. And I would see her about once a quarter, my second and third year of medical school. She was a year ahead of me. And it was like being set free. And like most of the time I would only stay one night and we would go out to dinner and then we would basically unload on each other all of the like completely crazy stuff. And we would laugh and cry and remind each other of like why we were doing what we were doing and what we wanted to do. And it was incredibly healing and incredibly important and it would recharge me and we would go back. We also worked together and we did a curriculum that each of us presented at our various medical schools and then that we continued to both work on a little bit as we got into our residencies. And then I still sometimes every once in a while pull out and still use. And so like that was really liberating to be able to push back a little bit on some of what we were experiencing and try to be like, well, at least our peers are going to be better than some of our professors. And so that was also really helpful, like with being able to sort of, it was like an act of hope and and sometimes what felt like a lot of despair and frustration. I stay in the same city where I went to undergrad. I had a, a faith community that was very vibrant and didn't always understand the disability, but loved me and made sure that I was fed and, and well. And then um, I had a pretty good group of friends. One of my other big uh, adventures as a medical student is that I lived in pre-ACA America, Affordable Care Act. I graduated in medical school in 2010. Residency, I had the ACA, but I did not have it for most of medical school. Unfortunately, I was the medical student that discovered that the medical school's insurance policy did not cover anything congenital, which is really unfortunate Mm -hmm. because I literally had never had a health problem that I wasn't born with. And so I was aging out of my parents' insurance, my third year of medical school, and I was uninsurable. And I couldn't qualify for Medicaid um, because I had stick kept my address with my parents in the you know in another state because I needed their insurance. <laughs> but now I couldn't qualify for Medicaid in the state where I was going to medical school. My parents figured out that I could stay on Cobra. For an absorbent amount of money. I don't know what would have happened if they didn't, because I also I paid a little bit of a price for all of that exhaustion um, and work that I had done the first few years of medical school. My degenerative joint disease in my hips definitely accelerated. And so I needed a hip replacement or I probably wasn't going to make it through residency, at least not in the way that I wanted to. And I didn't want residency to take six years. I really wanted to like stay on it a somewhat linear track. It's just a really long time to be a trainee. And so I needed a hip replacement. And then I had a rare condition, an adult orthopedist while I was terrifying. So I was going to have to go out of state for said hip replacement. And I had to make my fourth year schedule work so I could graduate on time. Because it's hard to like do the match late. There's other points in your training where I feel like you can be more flexible, but that is one that I I wanted to get to that, to that, you know, finish line at, at the right time. And so, again, I had a, a wonderful medical student who now is a psychiatrist in Peds Nephrologies, and she switched her rotation with me. And if I hadn't done that, I don't know if I would have been able to make it work. So, like, something, like, really small, like, she probably didn't realize. She knows now. But, like, at the time, I don't think she realized how, how impactful that was in making my life work out. And so, um, and then I was able to do, which is I highly recommend, I was able to do some research from my computer. Um, And so I was able to, they let me graduate on time. I am not sure I would recommend this, although it worked out okay. I interviewed in person 16, no, 12 weeks status post uh, a total hip replacement. (laughs)
As we continue in the interview, Dr. Meeks and Dr. Rule touch on one of the most feared experiences for medical trainees with disabilities, the match. The match uses computer algorithms to connect trainees and programs based on their rank order lists of one another. There are no guarantees in the match process, and for people with disabilities who require accommodations or specialized medical care, this lack of control over where they will spend the next three to seven years can be daunting. Listen or read along as Dr. Rule discusses her experiences with the match process. Were you afraid that you wouldn't match? Yeah. I would say the fear wasn't quite as strong as um, the med school experience. Um, I knew that I was a decent student. I knew that my USMLEs were all right. And like, like I had like gotten some of the other checks in the boxes and I was in PEDS. And PEDS was definitely one of the specialties that was less likely that I would go unmatched. But I was very worried because I wasn't going to have the final choice. The computer was going to choose for me. And so I was like, yes, I, I want to be a pediatrician. I'll go wherever it takes me. But then I was like, but will I? Can I? Because I thought about like all of those experiences I had when I had those acceptance letters in hand and like going to places and being like, well, crap, they're not going to work. I worry a lot about Zoom interviews for students with physical disabilities because you have no idea. You have absolutely no clue what the accessibility is like. I interviewed more widely than I did the first time, although still mostly focused on um, the Southeast, the whole East Coast, and then some places in the middle, and then some places in the Midwest. It's very interested in um, global health equity and like I continue to do work with disabled children in undergrad um, and then in med school in Eastern Europe, and then also some in East Africa. So I was looking for a PEEPS program that would let me continue that. I was trying to figure out what to find a good program for a student with a physical disability, because I heard a lot of different people tell me like a lot of different things. Some people said, go to a smaller program that's less high volume, less acuity, they know you really well. And like, they'll make it work. And then I had other people tell me literally the exact opposite. Go to a giant program. They won't even notice when you have to take time off because there's a million people to cover you. Go to a high volume program because then when you're like thinking about job or fellowship discrimination, you're coming from a big name. And then I was really surprised. The programs that I liked were not the programs that I thought I was going to like. So then that was... That was confusing and, and stressful because I'm like, what if they don't like me? I did have that fear. You know, I am a very relational person at baseline. And so like I sent the thank you notes and then like the programs I really liked, I told them I liked them. And then I did a second look at my first choice in part because it was in the Midwest and it was in a part of the country that I had never dreamed that I would live in. And it was a really big name. And I was like, no way they're going to take disabled me from a middle of the road medical school with middle of the road grades. They did, which was still uh, the, the match day video, which is taken on my sister's Nokia phone. And so it's like not very good quality. But I post it every year on match day because like I'm still surprised like 15 years later that they picked me. Um, and because it's like the most surprised I think I've ever been in my life. Like I it was like, I'm not going to scream. I'm not going to like make a big scene. I made a huge scene because I was so surprised when I opened that envelope. And so then, you know, after all those meetings and all that anticipating and all that exhaustion that I had experienced as a medical student, literally match day, I got a call from my program director and then I emailed my program director, which the call was very much like, congratulations, I'm gonna go call the other 40 people. It was very short. I emailed my program director. I emailed the chair of pediatrics. I emailed the chief resident that I had emailed. And I was like, all right, let's talk about accommodations. I use an amplified stethoscope. I need preferential scheduling. My posture is an aggressive stance because I am I have lived through the first four years of this and like, I'm ready for the fight. We got to do this. I got to stay ahead of the game. And I got this email from this chief resident who would one day be one of my pediatric hospitalist colleagues when I would be faculty at this place, you know, six years later. And she was like, Amy, we wanted you, like all of you, like we knew what we were signing up for. This is going to be fine. 
Residency is among the most physically and emotionally challenging times for any medical trainee. In this next section, Dr. Rule reflects on her experience as a pediatric resident and how her residency program director viewed her disability as an asset to their team with a unique perspective that informs patient care. And I also didn't know what I didn't know. I was at a relatively small peds program for my medical school. And so I, I didn't know that like emailing the chair of peds at like at a big name program on match day was probably like a bit like not what most people do. But I got a sweet email back from the chair and he's like, we're so excited to have you and we're going to make this work. And I remember sitting at my desk in my medical school bedroom and just like being just flabbergasted. Not only did this program take me, but they wanted me, they wanted to train someone with a disability. Like it was, it was not just like, she's a good student and we're not paying attention like to those other things. Like they, they truly kind of wanted all of me. And the third email I got back that day from the program director, he's like, this is basically the summary with, it's not our first rodeo. And so I, I definitely do think that like looking for programs that have a history of accommodating people, you know, I think can definitely be a great path. For me, you know, the biggest accommodation I needed was preferential scheduling. And certainly I, I, I think there are more than one way to do that as I've implied with the different advice I got. But being at a big program was helpful. Like I got my second hip done in my second year of residency, and it was way easier than getting my schedule moved around in medical school. The chief residents took care of it. And so, like, I do think that being in a bigger program for me was the right decision. It definitely helped when I was applying for jobs and fellowships. All, those, all of that proved and rang true for me. But I do think that, like, I have another friend who has kind of a similar disability. She uses her chair more. She went to a small program for peds and had like the loveliest experience. And so I do think that like, it, it is about fit. And in theory, that's how the match is supposed to work. You know, sometimes the match can be merciless. And like, it's harder to make that pitch. You know, and, and, and Pete's is probably both stereotypically and actually this way, you know, like we tend to be very relational people. And so I really like after I interviewed with someone, if I really connected with them, I sent them an email. I, I really tried to like build those relationships. And I think that that really helped me. And it also just made the match feel different than medical school. In medical school, I felt like I was shooting in the dark and like hoping that I was going to work out. Whereas I felt like in the match, although I ultimately didn't have control, I had a lot more opportunity during that process to make connections with actual human beings who were doing things that I was really interested in. Um, and I think that that helps. Like having that specialty, like narrower focus, I think was really nice. When I talked about being a pediatrician in a room with a child with a disability who was my patient, every single pediatrician, even the skeptical ones, they understood how that could happen and how that could be powerful. And so that was great. That was great for me. I mean, like I was, that narrative was not something that like I had to sell. They were like, yeah. We see that. There's one thing I haven't really talked about what was particularly relevant in medical school that was a bit more of a fight than residency as far as accommodations, which is that like most medical students, I feared the words technical standards, <laughs> um, specifically around procedures. Uh, so I've talked a lot about like my mobility and how my skeletal dysplasia ultimately impacts my walking. But it also impacts my hands. I knew that I probably wasn't going to go into a procedure-heavy specialty. So, like, I knew from the beginning I didn't want to be a surgeon and that maybe it wouldn't be the best thing for me to be a surgeon. There was some debate about whether or not, for example, I had to be able to intubate a 300-pound adult. And, you know, holding that laryngoscope with my wrist, even if I was able to get to a standing position, which I was for the majority of medical school, it was not something that my wrist was very good at and it was very hard. And then I was like, when I'm only going to have to intubate small people, why does it matter? There were some people at my medical school who were like, you're absolutely right. You're not going to have to do chest compressions on a 300 pound person or intubate a 300 pound person. You want to be a pediatrician. You've excelled in that area. This makes sense. 
But there were other people who were like, no, like she doesn't meet the technical standards. Like this is a problem. Um, and, you know, I had some really good advocates who was a neonatologist and he was like, she can intubate babies. It's fine. And that ended up like shutting down that whole conversation mm-hmm. about the procedures curriculum in medical school. But it was one of the scariest moments of medical school for me when this came up. It was on my emergency medicine rotation. And I really was worried that like some of the sort of dissenters were going to go to the higher ups in the med school and be like, we can't graduate her. Yeah. And I was like, for, I was pretty far along. I was in my fourth year, which I think definitely helped. I am not the world's best suturer, but I like did what I had to do for my pediatrics requirement. And then I um, requested that I did not want to do a lot that were elective. And um, it was fairly easy to do that because it's all in, in the same emergency medicine rotation. And so like I just signed up for other patients. I think I, I experienced what a lot of people experienced where like I had an ENT who was like upset that I told my otoscope wrong. And he's like, hold it like a pencil. And I'm like, this is how I hold a pencil. And then I had uh, people upset about how I hold my needle driver or how I hold my spinal needle. And I'm like, this is how my wrist works. I can do this procedure safely and I can meet the requirement. But you have to respect the fact that my body looks different than your body. Um, and it's like that, that definitely was hard. I would say in residency, other than the lacerations, which people were kind of respectful that like once I got signed off on it, that I didn't want to have to do a lot. My program was fine with that. But I do think you're absolutely right that like when those medical schools were looking at that young woman who was graduating from college and wanted to be a doctor, they were thinking, oh my goodness, how will we ever accommodate her? And then I think that I know for a fact, at least the Dean of Diversity at my medical school, because I I, I still see her every once in a while and I give a talk related to disability health equity to their health equity certificate program now. She has said, you know, how I thought that was going to go and how it ultimately went, it went so much better. And so I, I do think that you're absolutely right. And then I think most of the time people's fears on the medical education side are often far exceed the reality I knew I wanted to be a pediatrician and I have been able to do everything that was required of a pediatrician. I even did under wonderful supervision of, you know, pediatric intensive, I did central lines, you know, like I did the things that were required of my, my specialty training. Dr. Rule authored a paper in JAMA Network titled, I Am That Parent, on what it means to be a parent of a child with a disability. Here she discusses her motivation for this article and what she's learned from her experience as a parent that informs her work today. I am fairly open about the fact that I'm also a parent of a child with a disability. And so um, my son also shares my skeletal dysplasia. And that definitely has had a huge impact on myself as a person and then uh, really as a clinician, especially since I take care of other children. And then I relate a lot to other parents. It definitely changed like how I have certain conversations and, and how I listen, I think, differently. So I think that that's the main other way. It kind of impacts me as a doctor with a disability. Yeah, that would be so reassuring to me as a parent if I were coming to see you, knowing that not only do you understand personally, but you also have that parent perspective. I think that probably is a tremendous value add for you when talking to parents because you literally know what it's like to have these conversations. Yeah, a few years ago, I actually published a short paper that was called I Am That Parent. And it's probably the paper that I'm going to be the most famous for in my career. Not the maternal newborn outcomes research I do, but that paper. But it was about sort of the humility that I really learned in the first year of my son's life. There had been lots of times where I had participated in conversations in a workroom where I was like, oh my goodness, you'll never believe, you know, like what was just said or like what just happened on my round. And then I realized, oh no, I'm that parent. I am that parent. And then I kind of realized that like everyone would be that parent. Like you want to be the kind of parent that would advocate for your child. And so, you know, it's really was humbling for both my partner and I, but I think it definitely has made me a better doctor. 
I actually had showed a mentor who had done a lot of narrative medicine this piece that I had actually written in like a journal, meaning my like personal journal, not a medical journal. And he's like, Amy, you have to clean this up. And if your husband consents, you guys have to publish this. It's really an important piece. And I'm really glad I did. I had no idea like how much it would take a life on its own. But I think it's really important for us to think about perspective take when it comes to those conversations in in peds. And then I, I think it's probably true even beyond pediatrics in terms of people that we're caregivers for and that we're like an advocate for someone else who's sort of the patient in the room. But I think that that's something that a lot, you know, for me, I really was able to articulate this better after I became a parent of a child with disability. But I definitely think that I have had some similar paradigms and thought processes as a doctor with a disability. And I think that a lot of physicians with disabilities and chronic illnesses, we bring that to the table in a different way than physicians who don't have that experience. I think that there's a, an amount of perspective taking and sort of an active listening that is different when you've had that experience and you've been on the other side of the table. I don't think I fully was able to understand this until I had played all three roles, been patient, pediatrician, and parent. Um, you know, when I bring my anxiety or my anger <laughs> into the room, I'm not actually, most of the time, angry at the physician. I'm angry at the system. I'm angry at the ableist paradigm. I'm angry that the health system is not designed for my child or myself as a person with a disability and a person with a very rare condition where we don't always have the perfect evidence-based study to show what, what the answer is when there's a question. And so I, I think that's another thing that I really feel like I bring as a person with a disability and as a parent of a child with a disability when I'm in my physician role is that understanding that I, whether I like it or not, am part of a broken system. And I am trying to help people navigate a broken system while also working for the broken system. And so I think that sort of big picture thinking and perspective has also been an asset to me as a pediatrician in difficult conversations with families. And I just had an interesting situation recently when I was on service last week on newborn. These parents were really upset and I was like, I would be upset if I were you. And let me tell you what I would like to be able to make happen. And I want to tell you what I think I can make happen with the resources that I have. And then taking that conversation and debriefing with my learners, I had medical students and residents, and being like, let's call out the things about this that are wrong and acknowledge where these parents are. You know, it's funny, though, Dr. Meeks, when I was setting out to want to become a doctor and you know, I think I was like filled with some starry-eyed idealism that like I was going to be part of fixing the broken system and the optimist in me still believes that to some degree, but I definitely experienced various things along the way that were at times disheartening to realize just how broken the system was. But it's also really rewarding and a privilege to be able to now be in that role where I can at least label and call out some of the things that I wish were different and continue to work for that change. When you were talking about how you got the trainees in a room and you said, let's name this, I think that's amazing and what we need to do more because all of those trainees are coming in with the same wide-eyed optimism and they think they can change the world, mm -hmm. right? And I think, oh gosh, there's going to be a lot of disappointment here when they get into the actual workspace. As we conclude this episode, Dr. Meeks asks Dr. Rule to provide advice to learners entering medicine and to programs who are considering accepting disabled students. You know, I'm just getting to know you and we're doing some research together. You've been in from day one, so enthusiastic, so excited to get involved and I love and appreciate that you signed up immediately for the Women with Disabilities in Medicine mentoring program. And so you're already paying it forward in so many ways. This interview is one additional way where we can provide some mentorship to people that are in the pathway to medicine. You know, what advice would you give to the learner that's thinking about going 
to medicine or, you know, we can give advice to several stakeholders or to the programs who are considering accepting disabled students. You know, it's always hard to be able to, like, encompass, like, all I want to say, especially to, like, the student or trainee and, like, a sound bite, right? And I feel like I could give an entire podcast just on advice. Just, like, let me tell you, like, my, like, top 10 things that I wish I had known <laughs> in the beginning. Um, I think one of the things that I would say, and that I'm going to not lie, my therapist said this to me at one point, which is to, I would look them in the eye and be like, your expectations for wanting to become a physician with a disability or a chronic illness or however you label that thing in your life is not unreasonable. It's reasonable and, you know, like it's worth doing. We need more of you. Because I do think that you're exactly right in what you said earlier. There are so many teachers, pre-med advisors, med school professors, researchers who are like, this is hard, don't do it. And, and I would say to like that, that, that trainee or that student who has that like burning passion that they really want to do this, like that passion is reasonable. And like, you can, you may or may not ultimately decide that like you want to, and that's okay too, but like you can, it is not an unreasonable expectation. It is a, you know, a wonderful calling and path. And I'm not going to say that like, it's going to be easier. I like to think that it's like getting slightly better. At least there's more of us than there used to be. I'm not going to say that it's the easiest path towards a, you know, impactful career in medicine or an impactful career in STEM, but it is absolutely wonderful. And the, you know, like the ultimate destination, which we didn't really talk much about my like current career, but like, I love my work. And I, I do some work with disability, but I also do a lot of work that's not with disability, but I get to be the disabled person in the room. And I'm very aware of that, but like also in a good way that like, you know, like I get to be at this table, you know, making an impact in this way. And so your, your expectations are not unreasonable. And then um, my other piece of advice, which I think is a little cheesy and perhaps oversaid, but it, it certainly was something that was very important for me, which is like, find the people that you're going to do this with. And they might be other disabled people. They might be a partner. I didn't talk about falling in love. We can do that next time. And I have an amazing partner, an amazing husband who is 100% rooting for me and 100% loves all of me, including my disability. You know, so it might be a partner. It might be a non-disabled friend who's like my friend, Dr. Nelson. Find the people that you're going to do this with, because I think that's the way to get rid of everyone else's unreasonable expectations. Your expectations are reasonable. Other people's expectations are unreasonable, is to have those people that are going to be a part of that community for you. And then to programs, you know, I didn't talk much about this, but like I am a medical educator. I'm the chair for global health education for the Association of Pediatric Program Directors. I'm working on some of the, you know, work that Dr. Meeks and others are working on in terms of looking at how we can better understand and then also hopefully ultimately improve the experience for pediatricians and pediatric trainees with disabilities. So I, when I talk to program folks, I understand something about what it's like to be in medical education leadership at the undergraduate and graduate medical education level. But I also have been that disabled trainee begging someone to sort of take a chance on me, I surprisingly wasn't nearly as challenging as I think a lot of the, you know, ed medical education, especially in my undergraduate medical education and medical school, thought I was going to be. I wasn't nearly as expensive out of an investment in terms of time and money and whatever else you're worried about in that investment as they thought. And then the other thing is, is that and this is going to come out as a little bit of like, look at me, I'm so great. My presence in my, particularly in my undergraduate medical education environment, changed them. They took another student who had much more significant mobility limitations a few years after me. And the dean of admissions said, when she applied, your name came up. And, you know, like, I, I don't take that lightly. And so, you know, like, if there's a lot of sound bites about diversity and inclusion and health equity and representation. And you can't say that your program believes in those things if you're not willing to take a disabled applicant. 
or at least consider that disabled applicant. Give them an interview, let them tell you their story, you know, give them a shot. Amen. <laughs> Amy Rule, you are one in a million. That's true. That's a little cheesy. <laughs> so I, went, yeah. I think yeah, I'm less than one in a million. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. And um, yeah, I'm excited to get more involved with the Docs and Disabilities community. And I'm excited that we're going to do some uh, important original research within PEDS specifically. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Amy Rule, for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us today. We are so grateful for your insight on being a disabled medical student and resident and your unique experience of being disabled and parenting disabled children. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We hope you subscribe to our podcast and tune in next time. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M Disability Initiative, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Lisa Meeks, Kadisha Trico, Jasmine Lopez, Ari Natovich, Pranadi Mova, and Gabe Abrams with support from our audio editor, Jacob Feeman. 